I'm Don Hollister, president of the James A. McKee Association. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, I'll just launch straight ahead, introduce our moderator, Fred Bartenstein, and he's the boss tonight. Thanks. You can see the, the agenda, and each candidate will have five minutes to introduce themselves and to tell the most important issue to you uh, as part of your introductory remarks. And then the audience may submit questions in writing and only in writing uh, on note cards to, and you can address your question to a particular candidate or to all the candidates. And when you're ready for a pen, a pencil, a card to write your question on, or when you've got your questions ready, just wave your hand and a member of the McKee Society will come around and see to your needs. They'll bring the questions up to me and then I will uh, present the questions to the candidates. Uh, once a question is presented, there, the candidate will have one minute to respond. If the question is directed to all the candidates, then each candidate will have a minute to respond. Uh, if it's clear that, that, that the question, if the question wasn't clear, then I will try to clarify it and may give more time, but that will be my decision, not the audience's to you know, yell out and, 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 uh, and, and advise. Uh, if the candidate sends a sub, and all of you are here in person tonight, so this, this rule does not apply, uh, and we're gonna adjourn no later than 8.15. We're scheduled for half an hour of Q&A, but if it runs 45 minutes, we can accommodate that. Does that sound reasonable? A way to spend a night in an evening in Yellow Springs? <laughs> All right, well then let's begin with Amy Bailey. Good evening. My name is Amy Bailey, and I'm here today to share with you why I would be a productive member of the Yellow Springs School Board. I appreciate your attendance and the James A. McKee Foundation for hosting this important event. A little information about me. My husband, Jason, and I both grew up in the area. Our two boys started their academic career at Yellow Springs Montessori School and are now fifth and sixth graders here at Mills Lawn. There wasn't much discussion regarding where we would raise our family. We both naturally gravitated into the village for its diverse, proactive community and the school district's innovative approach to learning. I'm privileged to say I currently have four generations of family living here in Yellow Springs. After receiving my bachelor's degree in business management, I began my professional career as an academic and operations manager for a national college exam preparation company. For the past 13 years, I've served as the practice manager for our family-owned veterinary clinic. As a board member of the Mills Lawn PTO, a volunteer for the Mills Lawn Extracurricular Program, it's apparent how impactful school clubs, athletic programs, and enrichment courses are to a student's whole academic experience. In 2021, I was a member of the Educational Visioning Team and I'm currently a leader for the Citizens for Continued Education Excellence, which provides information on how the current levy supports our students and community. As citizens, it's important to understand the benefits of our public, the, the benefits our public schools provide to our future. The Ohio School Board Association compares the structure of a school board to an iceberg. Underneath, there lies so much information to discover. For example, the sidewalk improvements happening on Dayton Street as you come into town are all possible due to a federal grant supporting safe routes to school. Our district plays an important role in supporting our village infrastructure. 
If elected, I will make it a top priority to ensure every effort is utilized, every effort is made to utilize grants and available programs that benefit both our school and village. Another area I'm dedicated to is teacher recruitment and retainment. In a recent meeting with a building administrator, I was told where we used to see around 100 applicants applying for one position, we now average nine. When we are able to secure talented instructors, rather than relying on exit interviews, we take a proactive approach and utilize stay interviews, which are structured discussions our administration would have with teachers during the school year to learn specific actions we can take to strengthen engagement and resources for both our staff and students. I began meaningful preparation for my position as a school board member in early 2023. I've been an active listener and participant in meetings regarding our schools for the past three years. In April, I sat in this very gym, surrounded by our dedicated teachers, to hear them describe the deplorable conditions for which they have to work. As suggested by the Ohio School Board Association, I've carefully read the Ohio School Ethics Guide, participated in several online forums offered through the OSBA, and met with community members and building administrators in order to maximize the effectiveness within this role. I have a clear understanding of how I am expected to represent the district. I am one of five voices that collaborate and consider all available information to make the most informed decisions for our schools. Looking back now, I'm able to appreciate that the K-12 building didn't pass in 2021. Our new facilities plan is more aligned with the values of the village. Mills Lawn's campus provides so many benefits to our students, residents, and dare I say, visitors. I've realized that passing this levy is the first step in maintaining the use of our outdoor campus spaces for recreation, athletic, and environmental purposes. I hope all candidates on this stage will join me in supporting the unanimous board that has presented this as the best long-term investment in line with the values of our district. As we experience a very pivotal time in our village, tonight I'm asking for your trust to represent our schools with integrity and inclusiveness. The most productive board is a diverse board. We have very limited parental representation remaining. I'll provide a fresh voice that advocates for our kids and maintains the commitment to build community connection. The future is bright for our district. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Pat Peters. Hi, I'm Pat Peters, and I wanna thank everyone for coming for Candidates Night tonight. And I'm honored to be here tonight as a candidate for the Yellow Springs School Board. I'd like to introduce myself to some of you who may not know me. I attended elementary school right here at Mills Lawn. When I grew up in Yellow Springs, it was a time when families had a connection to Antioch College. Our parents either graduated from Antioch, taught at the college, or they were employed by the college. In my case, my father graduated from Antioch, and then he chose to raise his family here in Yellow Springs. I attended Yellow Springs schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. Going to Mills Lawn from kindergarten through seventh, and seventh grade, some of our classes were actually in the Mills house as well. And then eighth grade, we went to what was then called Bryan Intermediate School, and then Yellow Springs High School when it was a new building. I decided to run for school board for several reasons. One reason is after a group of Yellow Springs parents suggested to me that I would be a great candidate and had I ever considered running for school board. Yes, I had considered it, and the support from the group of parents was one of several motivating factors for me to run. Other factors include my background as an educator for over 30 years in the public schools and the vast experiences that I have had with students, teachers, administrators, parents, and the communities that I have taught in. An additional reason is my dedication to my hometown. After graduating from the University of Dayton with a BA in sociology and not many prospects in the field at that time, 
I became a teacher's aide right here at Mills Lawn. I was encouraged by the teachers who I worked with to become certified to teach. My first teaching job was at the former Morgan Middle School, where I taught reading and math. I moved out of state for eight years, and during that time became certified in special education. I taught in a high school resource room in Rumson, New Jersey, and it was there I started to devote the rest of my teaching career in special education. When I moved back to Yellow Springs in the 1980s, I continued my career in special education at Kenton Ridge High School in Clark County, and I retired from there 11 years ago. Since that time, I volunteered at Mills Lawn in a first and a second grade classroom. Additional recent involvement with the Yellow Springs schools is that I was a member of the strategic planning committee who collaborated to write the 2023 through 2026 strategic plan. Another reason why I'm running for school board is that I have always been proud to be from Yellow Springs and would like to be viewed as a positive representative of my hometown. During the last few years, the division in town about the school facilities has been a major concern for me. So that brings us to what do I consider to be the two most important issues facing Yellow Springs schools. The first is what I just mentioned, the issue of the school facilities. The current school board did the hard work to reach a consensus and a compromise, and the architect, with input from the schools and communities, community, excuse me, has put forth a plan that I would hope all would vote yes for. I am aware that some individuals and families in town will have difficult decisions to make. The other important issue facing Yellow Springs schools is the implementation of the strategic plan. In that plan, committee members identified what Yellow Springs values as five goals. The first goal, bold teaching and learning, has been a focus of the schools, and our schools have recently been announced as a five-star school, significantly exceeding state standards. A challenge moving forward is to continue that rating as well as identifying areas in the report that need improvement. Tied in with the first issue that I stated as a concern facing the schools is goal three of the strategic plan. Again, the facilities. Goal three states that we will provide a safe, comfortable, and accessible learning environment to instill pride and inspire current and future educational excellence. Having spent my career in schools, I know the importance of providing a safe and accessible learning environment for teachers, staff, and students. I have dedicated my life to education, and with the experiences that I have outlined for you as a career educator, and my dedication to Yellow Springs, I feel qualified for the Yellow Springs Board. Thank you very much for coming again tonight. Thank you, Rebecca Potter. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rebecca Potter. I'd first like to thank the James A. McKee Found, uh, Association for this wonderful event and doing this every year, every election for the community. And I'd also just like to acknowledge that tonight we have an amazing panel of candidates uh, giving you a choice. Uh, which is what this democracy is all about. Now, I'm, a represent I'm representing also uh, someone who has had parents, in, uh, kids in the school. I, I have a daughter, Evelyn, who graduated in class of 2020. Talia graduated in class of 22. Uh, this is a time when I can give back to the village uh, by running for school board. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am an educator at the University of Dayton, an English professor, uh, before that, I was also the inaugural director of the sustainability program for the university, uh, forming two majors and a graduate certificate program. I serve on the academic senate, have served on numerous committees, and have had success in uh, grant writing and uh, acquiring funding, not only uh, for research, but for other uh, community-based endeavors, totaling about $200,000. I am also active in sustainability education and had the honor of going to the United Nations Environmental Program meeting in Nairobi in 2019, uh, learning about how important environmental education and sustainability is for our youth. 
I even was able to march with some young students in Nairobi, and I will never forget the experience, as well as going to Korogocho slum, uh, where I was able to visit a classroom uh, with three grades in a space a tenth of this size, eager students with virtually no money, uh, and uh, still very eager to learn. So education is really my calling in my life, and I am so proud and happy to be part of the uh, district in which we live. And for this reason, one of the main uh, goals I see of the school board is to be a bulwark for some of the against some of the changes that our state legislature is proposing. Uh, we are facing a conservative trend that is seeking to censor what we teach in schools, restrict uh, programs like our own arts program, uh, plays like what was just performed, uh, She Fights with Monsters. Uh, that is a imperative that we unite as a community and as a school board to protect our teachers to teach what they ethically feel is right. We are also facing, of course, uh, a need to address our buildings. It's important that we build 21st century buildings that are, important, that are fitted for uh, renewable and clean energy and that will last and have a maintenance pro uh, program in place that guarantees that they will last. Earlier this year, I worked with former board member T.J. Turner, current board member Amy Magnus, uh, Cindy Seek, and Bob Brecka on a grant to try to get funding to uh, outfit our buildings with clean and renewable energy. We didn't get that grant, uh, but it did look hopeful, and I think that there's a good chance to continue those efforts in the future, uh, which I'll make a priority as a school board member. A school board member is an advocate, right? We're also cheerleaders. I was a member of the Boosters when my kids were involved in athletics. I currently also serve on the Environmental Commission, formerly served in the uh, Human Resources Commission for the Village, and that has also taught me how the village and the schools work together and can work together even more. But most importantly, I'm also concerned about the health of our students, the mental health of our students as we continue to recover from the COVID pandemic. Uh, and our schools and our teachers need to benefit from an open communication between parents, students, and teachers because we often find the best ways of addressing the cultural changes needed in our schools by listening to those groups, particularly our students, our teachers, and our parents. It's important for the school board to listen, listen carefully, and respond to those needs as, as uh, Amy was saying, a collective body. And I'm very much committed to collaboration uh, that is at the heart of governance I've worked in this area and have luckily received training in community collaboration as a professor. Um, and I've had, I think, uh, wonderful experiences serving on nonprofit boards in the region. And we see that when we work together, we can accomplish a lot. I am hopeful for the future uh, after this election, even though we face some serious challenges, we certainly face a very bright future uh, for our students as we see how much they achieve and how much they are able to accomplish in this very special place. And so I would appreciate uh, your support and your vote uh, this November. Thank you. And finally, Kim Reicheldurfer. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you. I want to say thank you to everyone for coming out tonight and supporting the candidates. Um, and thank you as well to the McKee Foundation. Um, second, I want to thank Amy, Pat, and Rebecca for their time, commitment, and to recognize how fortunate we are as a community to have four people willing to step up and dedicate time to run for office and support our schools. Now, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a mother to three children in the district. We've got Kylie's in seventh grade, Casey's in second grade, and Kelsey's in kindergarten. And yes, we're all Ks. Um, I have a STEM background with an associate's degree in mechanical engineering technology, 
a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in business administration. I have a professional engineer's license and a PMP project management certification, along with 15 years of experience in design and automation. I currently lead a research and development group for a cooking equipment manufacturer in Eaton, Ohio. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, Eaton is near the Ohio-Indiana border, uh, about an hour from Yellow Springs. I accepted that position in 2017, and it required a relocation from Marysville, Ohio. Uh, when we were looking for a new house, schools were our top priority. I grew up in a small rural school near Hocking Hills and wanted that same small school experience for my children. Uh, we did tour Centerville, too big. Um, we toured a small, highly rated district closer to Eaton, and I asked the principal if our children would have issues being from an alternative family with two moms. And her response was, I can guarantee that you won't from my staff, but I can't make any promises about the community. So that was our answer for that. At that time, our realtor suggested that on our way home, we stop and get dinner in Yellow Springs. This was in April, nowhere near Pride Month, and as we pull into town, there are Pride flags everywhere. So as we ate dinner at Peaches, I started researching the schools and found that the district was small, highly rated, art-centric at the time when other districts were cutting the arts programs, and prided themselves on being diverse and inclusive. We knew that this was the fit for us. We ended up finding a home outside of Enon and open enrolled our daughter in Mills Lawn. In 2020, we were fortunate to find land and build a home in Miami Township and moved into the district. Since then, I started gaining more experience in education. I lead the co-op engineering program at my full-time employer. I've mentored several senior design teams at the University of Dayton, and I recently became a part-time adjunct faculty member at Sinclair Community College. I have a passion for supporting and helping students grow. I understand that every student has a unique story and path, and it's essential to provide them with educational and mental health services that empower and support their journey. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the top issues that I feel need to be addressed should I be elected, um, but I'm happy to discuss further afterwards if anyone has questions or concerns. My top priority is facilities. I believe that our students should be able to learn in facilities where they are as safe as possible, and can focus on learning in sound isolated rooms, free of distractions that are climate controlled and free of uninvited wildlife. Um, <laughs> my, my second priority is earlier identification of and services for those students on what I call the ends of the academic spectrum. Those are students identified as gifted and those that have learning challenges. I wanna close with why I'm running. I'm running to provide representation for the LGBTQ community. I'm running to increase representation for the STEM community. I'm running to listen and provide representation for the parents of the district. And I'm running to listen to the community, the parents, the administrators, and the staff and find compromise. Most importantly, I'm running for my kids. I plan to have a child in the district for the next 12 years. I have a vested interest in our schools. I want to see the schools maintain the values identified in the 23-26 strategic plan, as that was part of the reason that we chose this district. Michelle Obama has said that kids will invest more when they feel they're being invested in. And if elected, I plan to invest in and vote for what I believe will be the best interest of the students. And I encourage you to invest in our children as well. And that investment can be in many forms. Of course, there's financial, um, but also time, energy, and love. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. Uh, now we're gonna get to a, a, a little exercise in collaboration. There's one mic and four people, so <laughs> you guys manage it. Um, I am going to uh, present the questions that we've received from the audience. If you, I see hands up, so let's collect those cards. The first question was actually part of your assignment. So I would ask if you did not address this question, what is the biggest issue facing the school board today? then you may respond now. But if you feel like you covered it in your, in your talk, we can move on. They feel like they handled that one pretty well. All right. Yeah. You, 
You will not be surprised that the next set of questions which I'm consolidating deal with your specific stance on the current school facilities levy. Would you each uh, speak to that? And if you covered it in your talk, re recover it. Um, so our school facilities um, need to be prioritized now. Um, I am an advocate for our students to have all of the resources that they need to succeed, and what we offer right now is not acceptable. I am voting yes for issue 12, and I hope everyone will join me. Thank you. Yes, I'm also voting yes for issue 12. As I said you know, in my speech when I was describing that I've spent my career in schools, I've been in some good schools and some not so good schools in terms of facilities. All the places where I've taught have been wonderful. But I do know that the school here and then across the town, those are the teachers and the students' working conditions. And they're not standard for the staff, the teachers, and the students. And we need an improvement for all of them. And so, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> and so, yes, I am for the issue. There you go. Here, I think I differ from my three uh, candidates. Not that I don't support the levy. I want to see a levy passed. We have to address the facilities issue. I have thought hard, long and hard about it, and I have decided to stay neutral as a candidate on this issue because I also want to see a levy passed even if this levy does not. I want to listen to the community and I want to be able to work with and for the community. That might not be the most popular decision, but it's the one I feel is the right one for me to take uh, given the division that we've seen in the past two levy uh, failures. And so I, I, I beg your understanding. Thank you. Thank you. And as mentioned in my, uh, in my speech, in my introduction, um, I do support the levy. Um, I can say going into the discussions, it's not the plan that I would have picked. Um, but I'm happy with a compromise, and I'm happy with what the current board did in coming up with a compromise for the community. I do understand, and I'm, um, I'm understanding that for some people financially, it's not a, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, however, for those of us that, that we can make it work, our students need new facilities. Um, I've touched on some of the issues with the buildings um, in my introduction, and, and I'm happy to say that I do support issue 12. The, 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 the next related piece may be more rhetorical than a question, and I believe Rebecca addressed it directly, but if you want to say anything in response to this, let me know. If this current $55 million levy fails again, are you willing to finally listen to our community and develop a reasonable and affordable levy that focuses on maintenance and needful upgrades and let go of tearing down and building new buildings? Well, I, I can start. I think I'll be the briefest, and the answer, of course, is yes. I understand that the school board uh, tried very hard in a, a divisive environment to put a ballot in front of the people. And I admire them for that and the consensus that they eventually found. That was quite a feat and they were doing their job. Uh, but yes, I think that if this levy does fail, we have to ask the community. People who say no will have to start saying yes, honestly. Yes, what will you pass? And uh, that's the question I would bring to the community. Um, I do support community involvement and community interest um, and listening to the community. And if this levy doesn't pass, I'd be committed to listening to the community even further. Um, but I do feel like the conditions in our school and the cost long term would be is best for new buildings. Um, but I would listen to the community with, with open ears, with an intent to understand, and maybe my viewpoint would change at that point. I understand the sentiment in this community that old is good sometimes, but we're talking about schools, we're talking about students, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about administrators. Um, we've just spent a year talking, 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 and coming up with a compromise and a consensus, and the current board worked very, very hard to get to the point where we are right now. So um, 
that's just where I stand. I think it's it's difficult. Um, if this does not pass, then I I mean so many options have, were on the table during this compromise and consensus time that I think it's been talked and talked and talked, and that's where we stand. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I actually did some research and. Um, over the past, I think, five years, um, we've had 97 meetings regarding our facilities. 97. That's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, and it's a lot of money. I don't know, we will have to go back to the drawing board if this does not pass. Um, and I don't know what the answer will be. Um, I do know that the bare minimum plans that were on the, that were, um, uh, that were considered are not acceptable. So I will have to go back to the drawing board after this levy, um, and I'm willing to do that. What is the relationship of the school board and the superintendent? And I'm gonna interpret that as what should the relationship be between the school board and the superintendent? So this um, superintendent um, reports to the board um, but it is also important to remember that the board does not act as any single individual. We are all part of a collective group that we make decisions and vote together. Um, I do believe that a healthy relationship between school board members and the superintendent will produce the best outcome for our entire community. Um, so I think that the uh, reading the bylaws uh, for the school district, it outlines uh, pretty clearly uh, what the uh, role of the school board is. It, Amy's right, you are acting as a body, uh, so you speak as a body. You uh, provide oversight of the actions of the schools, particularly budgetary oversight, and you're also a bridge to the community. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, you also provide oversight for the administration as a whole, including the uh, school uh, superintendent. So ideally, you're working collaboratively and communication is, is uh, healthy and strong. Uh, in those times when it seems that there is a division, I was very, very impressed by how we brought the community together. And I think the school board can lead on that, sometimes even before a crisis or a major issue. Uh, the school board does have a place to facilitate that kind of conversation. Thank you. My answer is, is almost identical to Amy's um, in that, you know, we need a symbiotic relationship between the, between the superintendent and the board. Um, I feel like the superintendent knows what's going on in the school on a day-to-day -day basis, and we need to rely on her opinion, her expert opinion, in all honesty. Um, of what's best for the schools, but also taking into account everything that we've listened to from the community, from the parents, and from our own personal experience. Then, did you want to say something? No. No. Um, the, the, the next question is from Job Interview 101. Describe <laughs> a recent situation in which you have successfully collaborated with a difficult person or situation. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we had a community meeting in here, um, I believe it was in the spring, and it was um, very positive, very upbeat. It was the um, mediation. Yes, the mediation society, um, Village Mediation sponsored it. And we had different tables, and you sat at the table for about a half an hour, and you discussed an issue. And it was a wonderful, wonderful evening, wonderful feel, wonderful discussion. Then when we got to the last table, we had four different tables that we went through throughout the evening. And at the last table, someone at my table started to discuss something we weren't supposed to be discussing. And I wanted to be very diplomatic and say, that's not what we're supposed to be discussing. And it got a little heated and then I felt bad because it was such a positive evening. We were able to reconcile, we were able to end the evening positively, but it was, a little upsetting after the feel of the whole positiveness of the meeting and then with the mediation group being there and sponsoring such a wonderful evening. 
Well, immediately what comes to mind is for the last several months, I stepped in as interim executive officer for Agraria. Many of you are familiar that that organization had to furlough 30 staff members, amazing people, in February. I had recently been um, appointed to the board, and because I had a, a chance as an academic uh, to fill that role, I was able, and I've been able to hand it over to a, a very capable person. We worked as a very much a working board, a collaborative board, to pull this organization from hemorrhaging to stabilization. Uh, it really pushed me to do fundraising at a level I thought I never would do. Um, but we've been fortunately successful. We've seen tremendous support from the community. If anything can give you faith in the optimism and endurance of people, that gave me faith in the people I worked with. And uh, I learned tremendously from that experience. Um, an example that comes to mind is, I'm, I've mentioned before that I lead a research and development group. Um, I have an engineer that, that reports to me. Um, and I was giving him the task of um, basically creating a design review for one of his recent designs, um, getting feedback from colleagues. And his response was not very good. Uh, his response was in line of, why do I have to listen to somebody else? Um, I'm the one that knows this design. I'm the one that created the design. And I don't understand why I need feedback. Um, so I pointed him to the company values. And we had a nice discussion. Um, and after that discussion, he held the design review came to me and recognized the feedback that he got and how valuable it was um, and, and acknowledged the value gained. Um, I'm lucky to, to um, not have <laughs> something that comes to mind um, that I've had to um, endure um, a situation where I've had to, you know, be in a stressful situation uh, to collaborate together. The mediation session, I do agree with um, Pat that um, that was a wonderful opportunity for everybody to come together and hear all sides from where all of our villagers were coming from um, and to just have alternate views and to be able to um, think outside the box and come up with additional ideas for our facilities. Uh, um. Rebecca, since you mentioned Agraria, there is a, a question here that I will slightly rephrase. As board vice president of Agraria, how were hundreds of thousands of dollars mismanaged under you, and can we trust you with millions of dollars of taxpayers' money as a school board member? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I, I think that we want to keep this uh, conversation on school board matters, but I will address that as best I can. Uh, so I became board vice president in January of 2023, and Agraria closed in February of 2023. Uh, so my uh, management of, of the finances uh, was, was short, and I was uh, under the hands of the treasurer, whom we asked to resign in February of 2023. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, I did not expect to find myself in that position. It taught me uh, how to um, hold people accountable as best as, as you can uh, without uh, holding them at fault for uh, it overextending your reach. Um, and I can say that since being a vice president, we've raised uh, over three quarters of a million dollars. And so um, I've had a leading role in that. And I could perhaps bring that experience to the school board. For, for, for all of you, yeah, tough situation. How will you work to get an inside out understanding of what the students, teachers, and school system currently need. And I'll add to that, if elected, how would you go about getting an inside out understanding of what students, teachers, and the school system need? I think by being in the schools is one way to help. Um, I mentioned that I volunteer, so I know in Mills Lawn School what the needs are, because um, I'm inside the school, 
And so with the high school, I know that the needs there are very many. Um, you know, you would collaborate with the principals, collaborate maybe with PTO, what their needs are. Um, so I would actually, I would stay active in the PTO um, to be a representative of the board um, for different organizations that we have throughout our schools. Um, my son next year will be over in seventh grade at the middle school, so I've already started to get my feet wet with the boosters. Um, started volunteering um, at the volleyball games. Um, so I think I'm, and I volunteer um, here in the school weekly, um, so I am here often to know what students and teachers are needing. Um, I talk with parents daily at, um, at sporting events and at school pickup. Um, so I think just keeping those open lines of communication will be um, the pathway to success. So I have two kids in college uh, who have a lot of friends who also graduated from the high school. Uh, the inside out perspective I bring is the conversations in my kitchen uh, from recent graduates uh, who talked to me about their experience in the high school and how they're doing in their career paths, whether they're in college or uh, pursuing another vocational path. Uh, so we have talked about diversity. I guess that's a perspective that's not on the school board right now. Uh, it focuses on uh, the high school and immediate uh, success right after high school and what that transition looks like for those kids. I think being a parent in the district, I have firsthand knowledge of the conditions in our schools and as well as um, the struggles and the challenges that our students and our staff face. Um, I talk to parents regularly and I can plan to continue to do that if I'm elected. And now a conversation that might go differently in Yellow Springs than it would in some other districts in Ohio. The junior high school the junior high and high school library currently provides free condoms to the children attending there. Shouldn't contraceptives and possibly morning after pills be available to the girls? Can you read that one more time? <laughs> the, the junior, yeah, the junior high, high slash high school library currently provides free condoms to the children attending there. Shouldn't contraceptives and possibly morning after pills be available to the girls? That's kind of, that's kind of difficult to answer just right off the top of your head. I need to think about that for a little bit. I guess, it, okay, then I'll come back to me. I think as a mother to three, to three girls, I believe 100% they should have that choice. Um, it's, it's equal, um, and I want them to have that ability, um, and it's their right to have that. I, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I, of, of course, I think it would go through the school nurse or find some other uh, mechanism than a, a tub in the, in the library, um, just because it is medication. Uh, but absolutely, that we also, though, this brings up a point we all have to be aware of. Right now, only abstinence is taught in our schools because of state law. Uh, and we are facing even harsher restrictions to education with the laws that are the shifts in, at, at the state level. So this does make us aware of the need to stay strong as a district, protecting those rights. Okay. I think at the high school, I'm quite sure they have a health class, you know, tied in with PE, and I think that could be part of a collaboration with the health class, um, talking about those issues and having a school board policy on those issues as well. So I think that um, conversations start at home um, at a very young age. Um, the rights that we have to our body um, and knowing what is um, available to us um, in in the case that we would need those types of um, preventative care. Um, I do believe, um, like what uh, Rebecca said, that you know a nurse, obviously, it's a medicine. It needs to be um, um, overseen um, before anybody has access to take it um, to keep in mind or to be um, aware of you know, anybody's personal health history.
There's a, a middle piece to this question that I left out. <laughs> It couldn't get more complicated. And here, and here it goes. Will free condoms be available to the 10-year-old children that will attend the new building once the grades are reconfigured? Um, my understanding of the floor plans are that the 5th, um, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are in one wing, and the high schoolers are in another wing. There are several bathroom facilities, gender-neutral bathroom facilities, um, that will be accessible for the younger kids. Um, my understanding is that we will do our best to make sure that the students have access to age appropriate materials and um, yeah. yeah, the younger students would be in a different wing from the high school students. And so if we look at the plans that are available, it's outlined that way. So there's not going to be, you know, the high school students with the younger kids all the time. It's going to be two separate wings. There you go. Got it. <laughs> on, on a detail like that, I really don't think the school board needs to figure it out. We can trust the teachers and the administrators to figure that one out. Yeah, I agree that, it, um, you know, the new buildings, there is the separation between the two age groups, um, and I do believe that the teachers can, can solve that problem. Um, however, at the same time, the reality is, is that people make their own choices, and if a student in fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade makes that choice, I don't think necessarily that I would condone that, but I would want them to be safe should they make that choice. How would you respond to a parent who wanted to ban books? Um, I believe that's the parents' choice as far as what books their children do or do not read, but I, and I believe that the teachers need to be transparent and maybe provide alternate assignments, but I don't believe in banning the books. Um, I believe that's a choice of each individual parent, but the students, you know, the, I don't want to ban a book that could, that could extend knowledge to a large group of students. I agree with that. Sadly, we have seen in other districts how one parent can disrupt teaching uh, in an entire district through an effort to ban a book. So it's tricky. You need to be able to listen to that parent, uh, make them feel heard, but also stay true to the principle of uh, having censorship-free libraries and classrooms. Uh, it's not easy to solve. Uh, fortunately, we can turn to other districts and people who are doing this kind of work all over the country, but we do have to be attentive to it. Yeah, I would. I agree with what both of them have said. And if a parent does not want a student to read a book, then you know they don't have to read it. Um, but I would not want us to start banning books. Um, we have wonderful libraries in both schools. And I would not want that to be anything that we would start doing. So I think that, you know, having a discussion with the parent, um, but that is not where we want to go. We do not want to ban books. I agree as well. We do not want to ban books. Um, we need to have access to all available information and history. Um, I believe, again, that it starts at home. If a parent does not want to um, have their child read a specific book, then they explain why, and the student needs to respect that. Um, but I do believe that um, diverse classroom libraries are essential to the success of our, the future for our children. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to, in the lack of, I've got one more question after this, but I'm going to escalate that question and not talk, take it from the standpoint of a parent wanting to ban books. But let's say the State Department of Education wants to impose a curriculum standard that Yellow Springs teachers disagree with. As school board members, how would you propose to address that situation? You want to start? We're going to start down here this time. <laughs> Um, I believe in open communication. I believe in listening to our faculty and staff. Um, and if it's a requirement from the state, 
I would work to find compromise and advocate for our teaching staff. Um, I hope even compromise will be possible. I, I, I'm as a member of higher education, and I've, I've worked with a group uh, forwarding an anti-racist pedagogy at the University of Dayton. Um, and we, as a private university, are free from the restrictions of the proposed Senate Bill 83 that will prevent diversity, equity, and inclusion training, et cetera. And, you know, it is, it is extremely hard. It is extremely hard to fight the state. But one of the things that I've experienced as a teacher, as an academic, that you have to have your administration, you have to have your board, uh, whether it be a university board or a school board, be that ball um, bulwark, uh, that, that defense, be united on this issue to provide as much protection as you can to the teachers. And that's why I made it my, my number one priority uh, going into uh, this election. Thank you. When I heard the question, when you restated it, I thought, well, how can we work around it? We're a very creative community, a very creative school district, and I would hope that that would be one way we could challenge it. Um, I know that our district would not accept having you know, those standards placed on us, but how could we work as a community? What could we do to work against the legislature in a creative way? Um, yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think um, turning to our community and asking for support, um, the more voices, the better. Um, and also just staying on top of the um, issues that are facing our state and um, making everybody aware so that they're able to write to their representatives and um, speak their voice ahead of time before anything um, is passed. The, the only other question I'm holding says for counsel. <laughs> so, I'd, if, in case you want to say something in response to it, you may. Do you support inclusionary zoning? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to say when we were answering questions for the Yellow Springs News and when we, those were sent to us, there were questions for all the other entities that are running, and I got into the page for Village Council, and I was like, oh my gosh, these questions. And then I thought, oh, look at the heading. These aren't for us. I felt a lot more comfortable answering the ones I was supposed to be answering. So I don't, I don't feel qualified to answer that either. All right. Anybody? <laughs> all right, well, Don, would you see that this gets to the council conversation? Um, I see one person writing, but you may be taking notes. Are you working on a question? Yes, my question is... Oh. Uh, it's all right. I will let you uh, address it verbally because it's the last one of the night. Go ahead. You may say it. Did you all understand the question? If, if you are elected, will you defend Mills Lawn? Now we're talking about the space, not the building, uh, as a place of recreation for the community in perpetuity. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think it's a very important space in town. I grew up playing all over this playground. I have memories of, you know, Little League started along the Phillips Street area um, where my brother played. I didn't get to play back in those days. But, I mean, it's a very important space for the town, and it means a lot um, to so many people that it's, it's important. Yes. Um, I agree as well. I think um, supporting, um, maintaining that property as it's currently used today is important to our village as well as our students. They use it for so many different educational purposes. I know that there are um, 
um, trees that are that have significance in the village as well, many of them on that property. Um, so I do um, believe that that property should um, be able to stay as green as possible. I heard in your uh, question the word in perpetuity, and I think that is what we need to work on, and, and s the sooner the better. So I, I agree, I think, with everyone else up here uh, that the Mills Lawn Green Space should be protected, and I've made it part of my platform, so to speak. We also need to see that a school is not in the parks and recreation business, and so how do we find a way to preserve the Mills Lawn Park, really, as a park for everyone to enjoy, which could allow it to be developed in a way that serves the community even more than it does today, and I look forward to that. And yes, I believe in the preservation of the Mills Lawn Green Space. Um, I think it's a valuable asset to our students, to our community, and I would love to keep it that way as long as we possibly can. Thank you all for your respectful participation and good communication tonight. Don, uh, this, your original plan for how long this would take is exactly on, well, actually, you've got one extra minute. And does that ever happen in Yellow Springs? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.